Lee Harvey Oswald, when he was giving out leaflets, uh, supposedly in support of Castro, the Fair Play for Cuba yeah. committee, 544 Camp Street was stamped on the literature. So this is where 544 comes into the case, through Oswald having worked there in the same building where Guy Bannister was operating. To underscore the significance of what you just said, what you are describing is a situation in which ostensibly communist material has stamped on it an address 544 camp, which is the location of the intelligence community in New Orleans, meaning, without a question of a doubt, this prima facie evidence, Lee Oswald was not a communist at all. He was uh, an agent provocateur. We later found out that on the third floor of Bannister's office, he located a small room and cleaned it out and gave it to Oswald to keep his pamphlets in. Since I was in the city and happened to be DA and had responsibility of seeing what Lee Oswald was doing this summer of 63, I went down to 544 camp to look at it and see what it was. And I took one look and I said, hell, this is a side entrance to Guy Bannister's office. I knew Guy. He used to be head of the Chicago FBI office and during World War II, he was in the office of naval intelligence. So... I came across uh, in the Warren Report. I'm surprised nobody else found it first. I, I found myself reading Colonel Folsom's 201 file of, of Lee Oswald and his personnel file in the Marines. And he casually mentioned, and here's Lee Oswald's grades in a ricin test. And somebody must have kicked him under the table because uh, he said he didn't do too well. He got almost as many right as he got wrong, but I wouldn't get any right in a ricin test. With all my years in the military, and I was a major by then, I never took a ricin test. He's a private taking a ricin examination. And so I realized then that there were signs of intelligence training of Oswald. And this was not long before, when he took this test, not long before he left for Russia. So obviously, in retrospect, he didn't leave as a communist. He left as a young Marine with an intelligence assignment. Otherwise, the Marines wouldn't be teaching him Russian. But I want to see what sort of places, quote, Russian studying Marine was operating out of, and that's what caused me to go down that weekend morning to Lafayette Square and look at 544 Camp Street, where I found, my God, this so-called communist the lone assassin, the man who's supposed to have murdered John Kennedy, the man whom, who was butchered before anybody could ask him too many questions, was, uh, was an agent provocateur working for the United States government. 544 Camp was a side entrance to Guy Bannister's office. Around the corner on Lafayette Street was the entrance to Bannister's office. Across the street in the post office building was an office of naval intelligence, and Bannister was naval intelligence in World War II. Secret Service was also across the street. Just across Lafayette Square around the corner was the office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and also on another floor, the office of the Central Intelligence Agency. The lone assassin, this person who's been described to all Americans, as a communist, was a soldier doing his assignment, a Marine soldier doing what he was taught to do after he was given intelligence training. The time that he began operating, the week, is not specific, but it's known that through August he was handing out the pamphlets, and earlier in the summer he was working around the corner at the Riley Coffee Company. Well, Mr. Riley, not necessarily involved at all, but apparently the nesting place was made available for some request the coffee company didn't know the reason for, but uh, request by the intelligence community for this nesting place for Oswald. He was operating out of the Riley Coffee Company. Didn't have that much to do, so he spent most of his time at the Alba Garage next door, which happened to be the garage. That was a garage for the intelligence community. It didn't even accept civilian automobiles. It was filled up with the intelligence community. So that's where he spent the earlier part of the summer. And then when August came, he was handing out the pamphlets as an agent provocateur to look like a communist so that when Jack Kennedy was murdered, he was being trained uh, like a turkey being fattened for Thanksgiving. If people still have a question in their minds whether Lee Oswald was acting alone or not, what comes to your mind as some of the most obvious and strongest proofs that Oswald was acting in concert uh, with others? After the assassination, when experts, the world's leading experts, attempted to duplicate the feat with Oswald's rifle, they could not even begin to duplicate the feat. So that alone indicates that Oswald did not do it. But even more than that, 
Oswald's gun was so bad, uh, that man like a Carcano was so bad that it was, it was predictable. It couldn't be done. But furthermore, even before the experts could hit the side of a barn, they had to have the sight adjusted. The sight was loose and not adjusted. And when you looked through the sight, you weren't looking down the same line as the tube. Lee Oswald was exonerated from firing a rifle on the evening of the assassination. The nitrate test showed he hadn't fired a rifle at all. And yet, uh, the man in charge of this operation, not only the assassination, but now the cover-up, were so cruel and so heartless that it wasn't enough to kill the president and uh, said, I may buy and let Oswald be killed as an assassin when they knew he hadn't killed the president. But it took eight months before the rest of America found out that Oswald had not fired a rifle at all because it was in the small print of the Warren Report. And so that's one of the most terrible things to happen, but now that can't be undone. One of the most critical steps in accomplishing the murder was the change of the parade route at the last second. On the morning of the parade, the Dallas Morning News showed that the parade route for the president, as it came to Dealey Plaza, was to continue on Main Street all the way through Dealey Plaza. That map was five-sixths of the front page, leaving just one column on the left. Now, what actually happened was when the presidential motorcade came and reached Dealey Plaza, without warning, it turned right. It turned right down Houston and left into Elm. It was a cul-de-sac where the ambush was waiting. And secondly, that double turn, the last leg of which was 120 degrees to the left, slowed his vehicle down to 10 miles an hour, where you could hit him with a rock if he had been going 25 miles an hour, as he had been, as planned uh, through the center of Dealey Plaza on Main, they would have been able to hit the side of the car. With it. But anyway, that's what happened. The parade was changed at the last moment. The parade of the President of the United States. I'd like to hear your view of the role, if any, in the uh, conspiracy to carry out the murder of President Kennedy and the cover-up of people like Alan Dulles or Warren. Alan Dulles is, uh, without the slightest doubt, a major participant in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy and uh, to uh, change the foreign policy. Because to appreciate Dulles, you have to understand that he is the man. Uh, even though the CIA was formed out of the OSS, special emphasis was given early on to the covert operations. But it was really under Dulles that killing became a science in the CIA and uh, something regularly done and accepted and done to Americans within America. That was truly an evil man. And I am satisfied that of all the corrupt things that Lyndon Johnson ever did, appointing Alan Dulles to sit on the Warren Commission and to find out who killed John Kennedy was very much like appointing a Brutus to investigate the death of Julius Caesar. He knew exactly who killed him and how he was killed, and he knew he was going to be killed beforehand. I have no doubt about that. Well, the other name was Earl Warren, but I'd like to see... Earl Warren, I think, is... Uh, I have to look at that in a different way. I think he was fooled. I really think he was fooled. He was called in. It happened uh, in a confrontation with Johnson. The, so they got an honest, well-intentioned man who uh, wasn't, to say, the greatest intellectual in the world and fooled him and had so, him sitting there surrounded by people who were really running the thing like Alan Dulles.